Welcome everybody. This is the Spider Silk webinar with our interpretive naturalist, Shannon Burke. Today she's going to give a presentation on some really awesome spider silk and spider ideas. After her presentation, there will be time for a Q&A session and we'll answer as many as we have time for. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us today. And I'm going to hand it over to Shannon. Hello, everyone. First off, I want to thank, thank uh, Michaela for being here with me today and helping out on the uh, tech side. And I also want to thank Shereen Ash with Corte Madera Library, who we partnered with for this event. And some of you may have found your way here today through their calendar. So let's get started. Just gonna share my screen here, get all set up and we're good to go. Okay, so today we're going to talk about spider silk and spider silk is one of the most amazing materials found in nature. Some of us might think that it's sort of this nuisance that accumulates in the corners of our houses or if you're out hiking or in your yard, you walk into a web and you know, brush it out of your face and don't think much more than, than that. But it's actually this really incredible, amazing fiber. So not only spiders use silk or produce silk, some other insects, or insects I should say, create silk as well, but they typically only use it for one stage of their life. So spiders are the only animals that use silk throughout their entire life. And they use it for a few different things. They make webs out of it, they immobilize their prey. They use it for drag lines or safety lines, which we'll talk about for reproduction and even for dispersal. So let's dive in. Okay, some of the, the things that make spider silk so amazing are these different properties that are kind of special to spider silk. One is that it's insoluble, meaning that it doesn't dissolve in water. And some spiders actually take advantage of this and they will create uh, little chambers underwater that hold air and they can take advantage of that habitat. It's also really long lasting. It's resistant to breaking down from bacteria. So unlike a lot of other things that decompose really easily, spider silk just doesn't. And it's got this amazing anti-twisting property. So if you think of a regular, like most other natural fibers, even if you think of hanging on down from a rope, you might swing back and forth, right? Back and forth until you reach this point of equilibrium. Spider silk, if a spider drops down on a thread of silk, it actually, as it twists, it distorts and that helps to stabilize it so it doesn't rock back and forth. So if you see a spider dropping down, it actually is pretty stable in the air. And it is incredibly strong. So it has what's called high tensile strength. And this means that it resists breaking when it's under tension. And so spider silk is actually stronger than tendon, stronger than bone, stronger than cellulose. So if you think of a tall redwood tree and the building blocks that sort of hold that upright, spider silk is stronger than that. Some spider silks are even stronger than steel. So if you look at this piece of barbed wire here, imagine one of these strands of silk being as big as that barbed wire and the silk would actually be stronger. Okay, so how do spiders go about uh, producing silk? We're looking at the, the back end of the spider here. And at the tip of its abdomen, it has these appendages called spinnerets and the silk comes out of those. So if you were to look inside the abdomen, you would see silk glands and all spiders have silk glands. Some only have one, some might have seven, most have about three or four. But I know that this slide has a lot of different words on it, but the basic gist is that you have these different silk glands and they produce different types of silk and each silk has different properties and they're used for different functions. If you were to look really closely at the surface of those spinnerets, those appendages at the tip of the abdomen, you looked under a microscope, you would see spigots. You would see just a gazillion little spigots. And out of each one of those comes a filament of silk. And those are called nanostrands. So if you imagine one line of silk stretched from one bush to another, it's actually made up of all of these tiny, tiny, tiny little nanostrands. And that is, is 
to a great extent, what gives it that tensile strength. So most people, if you think of spider silk, this is probably what most people imagine. They, they imagine a spider web, and this is kind of the classic spider web. A lot of different spiders make a web that more or less looks like this. So this is called an orb web. And it's made up of a few different parts using different types of silk. So the frame threads are the, the threads on the outer area. And then if you think of this as a wheel, the spokes of the wheel would be what are called radial threads. And the frame threads and the radial threads are made up of the same type of silk. It's this dry, stiff silk. So it doesn't have a lot of give. If you were to stretch it, it would, it would break after it stretches about 30%. And it's not sticky. And then you have the capture threads, which is that spiral that goes around. And then in the center, you have the hub, which is uh, a lot of times where the spider hangs out. So how does, how does the spider construct this thing, right? If you're, if you're hiking down a trail and there's this huge web stretched between a tree over here and a tree over here, how does it make that happen? Uh, well, what it does is it climbs up to a high point and it lets out a strand of silk and it floats along in the breeze. And then hopefully it snags on something and when it does, the spider can feel that. It can sense that it's caught on something and it pulls it tight and it reattaches it to where it is. And so that creates the bridge line, the very first line of the web. And then it crawls across that. And as it does behind it, it's leaving this slack line. Then it goes back to the center of that, drops down to create this sort of Y shape. And then it attaches that to the substrate or something down below. And then it starts to use that basic frame to create the rest of it. So it crawls up lines of silk and over, and it ends up building this whole web. It goes in and it does all of those radial lines, like the spokes of the wheel. And then it goes to creating the spiral. So first it lays down this temporary line, which isn't sticky, and it's kind of widely spaced apart. So it's sort of like the rough draft of the spiral. And then it goes back and it starts to lay down those capture threads. So the spiral is made up of what are called capture threads. And those are closer together than that temporary spiral was. And it's made up of this really stretchy silk that can actually stretch over twice, of its, twice its length before it breaks. And it's really sticky. So opposed to the frame thread and the radial thread that isn't sticky, this stuff is sticky. And the reason why is because it's actually made up of two different types of silk. So you have the original strand, and then that is covered with kind of a viscous silk, and that beads up into these little glue droplets. So this is a microscopic look at a few different species of spiders capture threads, and we have some of these here. Anyway, just to give you an idea what those little glue, microscopic glue droplets look like. So if this whole web was made out of those dry, stiff threads, if an insect were to hit it, it might just bounce off of it, right? Because it wouldn't have a lot of give, or it might break through it. But it's got that strong framework to hold it in place and to keep it structurally sound. And then that the spiral threads, those capture threads, have a lot of gives, so when an insect hits it, it absorbs the impact, and then those glue droplets make the insect stick to the web and give the spider time to get to it. And then once it gets to it, it actually secures the prey by using a completely different kind of silk to wrap up the prey. So it uses this to keep the prey from falling out of the web, right? So it keeps it in place, and sometimes it goes back and it eats it later. But it also helps protect the spider because imagine if this was a wasp or something like that, that could kind of fight back and hurt the spider. So it keeps the spider from being injured in that struggle as well. So if insects stick so well to these webs, why don't spiders? If you ever look at an orb web, it's generally at an angle like this. And the spider is on the side that's facing downward and it's usually hanging upside down. So if the spider was disturbed, it could quickly drop from a line of silk that's attached to the hub center there, and it could drop down. And then once the thread has passed, it can crawl back up. But if this web was completely upright, it might get tangled in the web on the way down. So a lot of times they're at an angle like this. But on top of that, 
they also have a couple different ways of avoiding uh, getting stuck in their own webs. So they always touch, when they walk around, they touch their webs with the same spot on their leg. And that spot has these tiny, tiny little hairs. And so as it pulls its foot away from the silk strand, the tips of those hair are all that's touching, which is a pretty small surface area. So there just isn't much to adhere to the web. And then on top of that, they have this coating on their legs. It's kind of like an oily coating that helps reduce uh, the chances of them sticking to it. So scientists actually uh, discovered this by taking spiders and they actually washed their legs and then they put them back in their webs and found out that they stuck to their webs a lot more easily once their legs were washed. So I just love the idea of, of washing these little spider legs and then sticking them back in their webs. Okay, so we were just looking at a two-dimensional web. This is the web of a black widow spider, and this has evolved from a two-dimensional web into a three-dimensional web. So this is built up of what are called gum foot lines. And each strand of silk comes down and is attached to the substrate with a little drop of, of glue, made of a different silk again. And it's, it's kind of lightly attached to the substrate. And all of these strands are really elastic. And so imagine an insect coming along and it brushes up against one of those as it's crawling around, it would get stuck in it and then it actually breaks loose. And because it's, it's kind of like a bungee cord, right? So it, it pulls the insect up into the web once the tension is released from being stuck to the substrate. And so the insect is sort of just thrown up into the web. And then the more it struggles, the more it gets caught. Some spiders create webs that aren't sticky at all. And it's just that they're so densely woven that the insects end up getting caught up in it. They get tangled up in it because if you were to look at an insect leg like this, I view this as a housefly leg, it's got all of these hairs and spines and insects also tend to walk kind of flat footed. So if one gets caught up in a web like this, it's gonna get all tangled up and then the spider, who's hiding in its retreat, actually comes running out on tiptoe. So they don't get tangled up in their own web and they can grab that prey, take it back to their retreat and eat it in safety. So then there's this whole different kind of silk called cribbillet silk. And if you look at this, it's got a really rough texture. And if you look really, really, really close up, it's all these sort of tangled strands opposed to, remember this, this slide of the regular silk, with those nano strands are nice, nice and smooth. So on the cribbillet silk, it has all of these, this fuzzy woolly texture, which means that the insects are more likely to get tangled up in it with those hairs and spines. But it also has this really incredible property where this type of silk actually fuses to insects. So insects have a, a lot of insects have a waxy coating on the outside. And when it hits this silk, it sort of starts to kind of melt into each other. And so the insect kind of gets cemented into the silk itself, which helps the spiders to, to get to it before they get away. So the cribbillet silk is made in this special structure called a cribellum, or it's, it's comes out of this structure called a cribellum. So the red arrows are pointing to it here. So it's next to the spinnerets and different spiders. It looks a little bit different. And then all of the spiders that produce cribbillet silk, something on their leg that looks like a little comb. And so they kind of comb it out. It's almost like carding wool as it comes out of that cribellum. So my favorite cribbillet spider that we have here is the triangle spider. This is a little triangle spider. You can see it's nice triangle web and then the tiny little spider over there. And this is made out of cribbillet silk. So it's not sticky. It doesn't have those glue droplets on it. But this web is so efficient that this spider actually doesn't have venom. It's our only non-venomous spider because it just doesn't need it. So what happens is you see that the spider is sort of in the middle of the, the anchoring line there. And what it's doing is it's pulled up that line of silk and it has kind of an excess back at its back end. And the, with its front legs, it's holding that line really, really tight. So when an insect flies in and hits the web, it releases that slack line and the web actually collapses on the insect. I know this is a, a fuzzy photo, but it happens so fast that this was the best one that I could find a way to actually capture it. 
So then the, the web collapses on the prey. And then as it struggles, again, it's sort of fusing with that silk and it's getting tangled up. So incredibly efficient webs. Some silk is actually ultraviolet reflective. And the reason why this can be beneficial for a spider like this, like a black and yellow garden spider, is they, they create this zigzag in their web. It's called the stabilimentum. And if you imagine pollinating insects, they are flying around and they're looking for flowers and they're looking for nectar in particular, right? So a lot of flowers have what are called nectar guides and they're these ultraviolet reflective patterns. And so those attract insects. So spiders have taken it up a notch by actually incorporating that into their webbing. And so it actually lures insects into their web and then of course they get caught. This is another one that uses a strategy to attract insects to its web. This is the debris spider or also called the trash line spider. And the reason for that is because it takes the, the exoskeletons of prey that it's already eaten and it wraps them up in silk and sometimes it uses little bits of debris from, from nearby plants, wraps all of that up into silk and attaches it in this line in its web and it helps camouflage the spider. So this photo is up close, so it might have been easy to see that spider, but if you find these in the field, they're really, really small and they can be hard to find the spider in that line, which protects it from predators like wasps or birds, things like that. But the other thing is these webs, when they're decorated with all of this stuff, they actually attract 150% more insects to their webs than undecorated webs. So again, they're, they're actually using this stuff, wrapping it up in silk and attracting insects to their webs. Some spiders don't make webs. They're active hunters, like this adorable little jumping spider. So they don't make webs, but they use silk every single day of their lives. And one of the things that they might use it for is actually a little retreat on if it's a rainy day or at night, they might take a leaf, fold it over and spin a little webbing in there to keep them safe and protected. They will also do this when they go to lay their eggs or when they need to shed their skin as they molt to get bigger. So these guys are active hunters and you can see here this jumping spider is, is in mid pounce onto this cricket. So they kind of hunt like cats. And if you imagine it jumps from this leaf to this leaf, but what if it misses? It would go plummeting to the ground, right? Unless, of course, it's got this safety line. So these are called drag lines. And this is made of the same type of silk as the frame and the radial lines in an orb web. And these are the strongest silks made. These are the ones that are really stronger than uh, steel. So it has this line of silk that it's, as it's wandering around, it's constantly spooling this out behind it. And then it intermittently attaches it to the substrate with a little dot of glue, which is a different type of silk so that if it jumps and it misses, then it hangs. Instead of just falling down to the ground, it, it kind of has this safety line and then it can crawl back up to safety or wherever it was. Some spiders don't create webs and they're not active hunters, they're burrowing spiders. And we have a few species here and what they do is they actually dig out this burrow with their mouths. Then they, they sort of use saliva and soil to line it to create this waterproof lining and then they cover it in silk and extend that the tube comes out and then they attach plant debris around uh, the outside of it to that silk so that it's really well camouflaged. So these are nocturnal spiders and then at night you can really see this silk tube here right and so the spider comes up at night and it just hangs out at the edge and hunts. Similarly trapdoor spiders are also burrowing spiders and they've kind of taken it up to the next level where they've created this door out of silk and it's hinged. So this is the trap door spider. And when that door is shut, it's completely, really hard to find these guys. It's very well camouflaged. So again, they attach plant material to the top. Okay, so reproduction. Spiders even use silk during reproduction. So a male spider, creates this little sperm web, it's, it spins this special web, and then it deposits sperm on that. And you can see it looks like he's got these boxing gloves, right? This is a male lynx spider. 
what he does is once he has his sperm web, he deposits the sperm on it, and he dips those, those are his reproductive structures, into it. It takes up the sperm, and then he's ready to go off and find a mate. And one of the ways that he finds a mate is that female spiders, when they're ready to mate, when they're mature, their silk is actually coated with pheromones. So these are pheromones that kind of drift on the breeze, and so a male spider can, can sense them. And some spiders, like those jumping spiders that are active, as the female goes around and she's laying down that drag line that's coated in pheromones. So if a male comes across that, he can he basically tastes that silk and knows that there's a female at the other end of that. So pheromones are really important and their silk is, is covered in it. And that's one way how these spiders help uh, or find each other. And then in the case of a black widow spider, he's, he's, he's a little bit rude. He finds the female and then he goes about destroying her web because keep in mind that silk is covered in pheromones. So males in the area, other males might find her. So he wants to make sure that he's the only one that, that finds her. So he goes about and he snips all of those threads of her silk. Remember that gum foot line uh, photo that we were looking at? So he snips away the edges of her silk and then he wads it all up into this little ball and he covers it with his own silk which has his pheromones on it. So it masks her scent so that other males can't find her. And then once she signals that she's ready to mate, he actually wraps her in what's called a bridal veil. So very loose strands of silk that he covers her in and they're covered with his pheromones. And it's thought that this might help to subdue her so that she basically doesn't end up making a meal of him, right? And a lot of people think that all male black widow spiders end up being uh, a meal for the female, but it's actually not true. Most, most males go off to live another day, see another day. All right, so as they've mated, then the female uses different types of silk to create an egg sac. So some, like the cellar spider, might be very simple because she actually carries that around in her mouth, so it doesn't need to be really too well protected by silk, but most spiders really create this, this nice encasing for their eggs. And that can take a bunch of different types of silk in the creation of these egg sacs. So there might be the original silk that she lays the eggs on and then she covers it in one type of silk and then the outer cover is a different type of silk. And then once the eggs hatch, you end up with all of these little spiderlings. And you could see that this might be tough if you are a little one of these little spiderlings competing for resources, right? So you want to get away from your siblings so that you can have your own spot and your own own resources, like your, you know, your fair share of insects. But also these guys can end up eating each other. So you want to avoid cannibalism. So spiderlings, little tiny spiderlings disperse. And once again, they use silk to do it. So they actually use silk to fly away to a new spot. How that works, this is called ballooning. So how it works is that the atmosphere has positive electric charge and the earth has a negative electric charge. And if you think of magnets, those opposites attract and create an electric field. And so the spider gets up to a kind of tall pointy spot where the electric field is the strongest. So on top of a blade of grass or on a fence post or on a flower or something like that. And then it spools out a line of silk and Remember all of those tiny, tiny little nano strands that are in every line of silk? That electric field creates a static charge. So if you think of rubbing a balloon in your hair and then your hair stands up. So those nano strands kind of spread out and it creates this little silk sail. And then it waits for a breeze to come along. The breeze catches that silk sail and it gets up on its tippy toes and then finally it, it releases and it flies away. And hopefully it lands in a perfect place for it to start a new life and start using silk in all kinds of different ways throughout its whole life. So that's it. So I think we can open it up to questions now. First question, what is the lifespan of a spider? It depends. Most spiders live about one year. That's the, the majority of species. So they might overwinter as eggs or as little spiderlings. 
And then they really kind of start to grow in the spring and summer when there's more prey available, when there are insects. And they go through a few molts as they grow. They get bigger, bigger, bigger. And then ultimately, most spiders are looking for mates in the fall so that they can lay their eggs. And then a lot of spiders don't end up living through the winter. So they die before the winter. There are some exceptions, like black widow spiders are, are pretty long lived. Uh, they can live for a few years. And then the burrowing spiders, like the turret spider and the trapdoor spider that we looked at, those are really long lived spiders. Uh, they're not, they're kind of sit and wait hunters, so they're not using a lot of energy. So they can live males typically like five or six years, and then he goes out and finds as many mates as he can and then ultimately dies. But females are really long lived. They can live uh, over 20 years in some cases. All right, next one. How does the turret spider capture its prey? So they, yeah, I showed that photo of it coming up to the edge of its burrow. So at night, they come up and they hang out and they, I showed that slide of insects being covered in hairs and spines. Spiders actually have hairs all over their bodies and they have these special hairs called trichobophria that, that sense vibrations. So soil-borne vibrations and airborne vibrations. So that spider, the, the trapdoor spider or turret spider is hanging out at the edge of its burrow. When an insect comes close to that burrow, they can sense the vibrations of the movement. And what they do is they leap out and they hold on to the edge of the burrow with their hind legs, grab their prey, and then pull it back down into the burrow and bite it so that it becomes immobilized and then eat it in the safety of the burrow. Oh, that's interesting. Next one. How are spider populations holding up? You know, I I don't know so far as globally or even locally, but my guess is that they are, pro you know, they, they eat insects and insect numbers are declining due in part to insecticides. So I'm sure that that has an effect on spiders. And I feel like I've been doing a spider walk annually every year for a, a while now, I don't know, maybe like 10 years or so. And I feel like I'm seeing fewer and fewer spiders lately, especially in the last several years. Part of that also could have to do with the drought. So we went through this really severe, long drought, and that seems to have had an impact on spiders. I know the burrowing spiders really seem to get hit hard by the drought just because they, they desiccate, they dry out easily. So yeah, anecdotally, I would say that their numbers, just from my experience, it seems like their numbers are decreasing, but I don't know of any studies or anything like that. Mm -hmm. All right, this one's an interest, interesting one. They seem to climb their silk very fast. Are they reabsorbing it? No, not in that case. They're basically, yeah, just, just crawling back up it. But it's interesting that that brings up an interesting thing. So those orb webs, the sticky stuff, that spiral strand, breaks down really easily, it loses its elasticity and its stickiness. And so spiders need to re-spin their webs pretty much daily. And sometimes they'll, they'll keep the frame wet web, sorry, they'll keep the frame lines, but then they'll re-spin the rest of it. And when they do that, they actually eat their old silk. And silk is made up of proteins. And so they're recycling those proteins. And studies have shown that that protein gets recycled and shows up in their new webs within 30 minutes. So they're really quickly sort of using those nutrients without letting it go to waste. Hmm. Another one, do they rebuild their webs when they get too visible? When they get too visible, some, you know, some spiders, like those big black and yellow garden spiders, it seems like they, they kind of want their webs to be visible and there's even some thought that the yellow on them attracts insects as well as that ultraviolet line in it because insects, a lot of pollen is yellow. So anyway, they're quite conspicuous. Some webs are harder to see, but for the most part, no, I don't think, I haven't heard anything about them redoing their webs when they're too visible. All right, what birds eat spiders? I would say pretty much any, any insectivores as they're going around. You know, a lot of spiders are really small 
And so as they're going around on vegetation and gleaning insects, uh, basically like warblers or a, a lot of different things like that are going to eat insects. I, I would say even things that are crawling along bark, like, like uh, creepers, things like that, ground creepers. And then even hummingbirds will incorporate spider web into their silk. So they're definitely paying attention to spiders. And we think of hummingbirds as being nectar eaters, but they eat a lot of insects. So I'm guessing that if the hummingbird came upon a, a small little spider, they would eat it as well. Do all males look as different from female as with the black widows? It's interesting. Across the board, male spiders are smaller than females. In most species, it's really significant. It's really pronounced. And so, yes, they look a lot different. In the black widows, even the color and the pattern is strikingly different. In some other species, they look more similar, but the, the male is just smaller and he's got a skinny little abdomen. The females have, especially once they're mature, this big abdomen because they're full of eggs, right? There are a couple exceptions like that funnel web weaver, the one that had the non-sticky web that, that runs out on tiptoes and, and then back into its retreat to eat. The male and the female look pretty similar in that species, but for the most part, yeah, there's a striking difference. All right, another interesting one. In some light, webs can act as prisms. Is this a special type of silk? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, I don't know about that. It's probably just the way that the light is hitting it and the way it's made up. Interesting. All right, this is our last one. Do any spiders steal prey from other species? Yeah, that's a great question. It's funny, uh, we are just talking about the male and female black widow spider. The males, when he first finds a female, he might take advantage of insects that are stuck in her web. I know that that species definitely does. Other males will do it. A lot of males, they kind of hang, they find a female that isn't, that's like one, one molt away from being sexually mature. And he'll just hang out in her web for a while and wait for her to go through that final molt because it's, it's better to just wait there until she's ready to mate and, and instead of going out and trying to find a mature female. So in the meantime, yeah, some males will steal prey from the females in their webs. And then there's also some, some pirate, or sorry, some spiders that are pirate spiders, and that's how they make their living. Basically, they go around and, and snatch prey that's caught in other webs. Awesome. All right, so that was our last question. It looks like we're just about done with our time. So... Thank you everybody for joining today. And thank you, Shannon. This was a really great presentation. Yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in. This is fun.